we're live. Welcome back to Profession the Idiot, episode number nine. I'm Nick Wolfinger. And I am Dalton Whitehead. Awesome. That's good. You were Dalton Whitehead last week. I'm glad you're still the same person. Yeah, I still identify as Dalton Whitehead. Uh, my preferred pronouns are him, he. So. <laughs> What's on your mind this week, Dalton? You know, I think... Uh, you know, we've covered some politics and some current event type subjects, but for those of you that don't know Nick, he's been a professor for a long time and has done some interesting research. He's written some books, and I thought it would be a good idea to have Nick share a lot of the work he's done, work he wants to do in the future, and uh, and the reason why he's done the work he has. So that's a question I have. I, I haven't gone too in-depth of what he's studied and the data he's collected, but, you know, following him on Twitter, he posts a lot of his stuff and stuff relating uh, to the work he's done. The, the question why is a big question for me, how, <laughs> how, you got, how you got started in that area of life so that is going to be disappointing <laughs> i don't think so i think people will be interested did we talk about this at all in the first episode where we introduced ourselves well i mean you said that you were a professor and you talked about going to grad school a little bit but i think you said that you weren't sure what you wanted to study even in college yep so i guess yep. let's Start about the time you got your uh, bachelor's degree and sure. went go from there, kind of. Okay. Well, this was always our fallback episode. Plans from there wasn't a current event that we really wanted to hit up, and we still had a little more research to do for things we want to talk about uh, later on, like taxes. I've been a professor now for 21 years and published four books and a bunch of articles, so we can't cover it all, but I can certainly talk about some of the highlights or lowlights. But let me answer your question first, Dalton. My father was a college professor, and I noticed that he was home most of the time, and he didn't seem to work very much. And that was very appealing. Second, uh, I was brutalized by the 13 years from ages 5 to 18 that I had to get up early five days a week to go to school. That fucking sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. My parents wouldn't have done it if not for me. I had no siblings. And so I really wanted a life where I didn't have to get up early in the morning. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, playing in punk rock bands sounded good. Getting laid sounded good. It was not clear that either of those formed a viable career strategy. I was a very late bloomer. But for the reasons I stated about my father's lifestyle, being a professor sounded appealing. I was interested in things. Uh, I read. I always read a lot, and my mind worked, and I realized that I'd be able to do a lot of that. And getting a PhD in a lot of fields is great if you don't know what you want to do with your life, because people speak about college as a four-year vacation. Well, I took an eight-year vacation. Well, it wasn't really a vacation. I was working hard, harder than I'd worked before, but it basically answered all of my career questions because if I went and got a PhD and actually finished grad school, that would really train me to do one thing, and that is be a college professor. So I didn't have to make any more career choices after that. That having been said, I didn't really understand what it entailed until I started grad school, what my father really did, what professors really did. But I found I liked it. I liked thinking about data. I liked answering questions about the world. Now, Ed, by the time when you were in college or before college, did you have like a quote-unquote regular job? N no. My parents were happy to pay for me to go to college. 
they had both been to college, so it was, as I mentioned in the first episode, expected. Uh, so they paid for a lot of it, but to, for a lot of, uh, for, I think, the majority of college, I did work. And what did you do? I had, I was very lucky. I had two different jobs that were both interesting and meaningful. One was... I took the class I talked about, I think, the first week of ep of uh, first episode of this podcast, class on cults and mind control. Did I talk about that? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Oh, I'll tell the story. I'd been in college two years. It was the first day of the semester. I had no major and no classes, and I was sitting on the steps at UC Berkeley where people hung out smoking cigarettes. And my lifelong friend, Sasha Lubkoff, came up. I've known Sasha and his twin brother since kindergarten, and we remain friends. Anyhow, Sasha came up and he said, Nick, I was just in the best class. And then he said, I swear to God, it was better than TV. <laughs> and it was a class about cults and mind control and how people are convinced to do unreasonable things and it was fascinating and I got the only A plus of my college career in that class and that convinced me to be a sociology major since I did well in the class I did something uh, bold I did something bold and uh, something that I didn't expect any any return on. I just sent the professor a note after class saying, thank you, Professor Offshe. I really enjoyed your class. If you ever need anyone to grade papers for your class, be a reader in the future, I'd happy, be happy to do so. And then I didn't hear back from him. And then a year later, already halfway through the semester, he contacted me and hired me in that capacity for a couple of years. So I got, that's an unusual opportunity for an undergraduate student. It paid well, and I worked for a professor in a close capacity. The second job was at an adolescent drug rehab where I had done volunteer work. And then they hired me on. And initially, it was just as a tech, you know, someone who helps keep order. But eventually, they started letting me do some clinical stuff, run groups and talk to the kids. And it was was the easiest job I ever had and the hardest job all rolled into one. It could be heartbreaking, it could be moving, but it felt like I was really, this sounds like a cliche, but making a difference. And it also got me thinking about a lot of different social issues when you have a facility like that. Hmm. So I'm lucky. They were both, they were both really good jobs in different ways. So you never had a <laughs> – what comes to mind uh, for me is a, uh, being a busboy at a pizza nope. restaurant. Nope, nope. Earlier than that, I had – I first used a computer in 1974, so I had computer skills. So before that in college, I was able to work you know, using my computer skills, which far fewer people had in 1985. Hmm. That's a very good skill to have at that yeah. time. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just, I was just in the right place at the right time. If you read a biography of Bill Gates, he tells his story. You know, he tells the story. You know, he was probably one of, in 10 high schools in America that happened to have computer access in the late 1960s when there were no personal computers. It was all terminals connected to mainframes, and he was just happened to have it. Same, same with me. I just happened to be a science museum nearby with computer classes that my parents randomly enrolled me in when I was eight after school. So I guess from a young age, you knew without even experiencing it, you didn't want that nine to five grind and having a, 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 a regular boss, like you, yep. I guess you could say. Yes. Higher education People become professors, many of them, because they want to be left alone. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to go. I mean, for me, uh, you know, I've had 
very difficult jobs. I mean, the job I'm working now is construction, and some days are pretty easy, some days are hard. But, you know, my ultimate goal is to not have a boss and to either be a, eventually be a high school history teacher or just teach jujitsu all day. That would so, be awesome. Yeah, that, that, I'm with you on that of not having, be, being your own boss, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know you have curriculum or faculty meetings and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But for the most part, your work schedule is dictated by you. Totally. You're, ve- you're very unsupervised. And that's how it is in America, where the more education you have, the less supervision you have in your job. I've never, it's one of the reasons we're doing this podcast. I mean, aside from a little work as a part-time, just a few hours as a gardener in high school, I've never had a job that involved physical labor, let alone hard physical labor like you do. You're very lucky. (laughs) I think that's an important point. People often venerate factory jobs. Those are the real Americans. People, both liberals and conservatives, look back to the 1950s when anyone could get a factory job that paid a great wage and let you buy a house as a golden era. And most people, given the choice, would rather not do hard physical labor, would rather not work in a factory. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's one thing. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember where I heard this idea, but I think it was on a podcast. But somebody I was listening to was talking about like the feminist movement in the uh, throughout the 20th century, I guess you could say, of women really wanting to be able to go into the workforce. Or I guess our, a funny joke from a comedian, Bill Burr, had this joke, and and he's like, he basically says, like, being a stay-at-home mom, like, you have no no time card, no taxes, like, you're off the grid, like, you won. Like, that's, like, the ultimate, you know, it's almost like, not that I'm a, I mean, I'm in no way against women wanting to work and pursue their, their goals and all that stuff, but it is kind of funny, like, I think a lot of women were, they, they thought, like, going into the workforce was, like, a, empowering uplifting thing when most people that are in the workforce are kind of <laughs> like yeah this kind of sucks yeah. <laughs> i think you're, you're you're misreading the history of women in the labor force in the 20th century probably the majority of women did work before they were married but a they stopped working when they were married and b they worked in only a few op- uh, a few occupations namely teacher nurse receptionist, typist, phone operator, and uh, that's more or less it. And what women wanted was the ability to work in the fields men can work. Now, how recent was this? What was this like? My mother, who in the 1950s worked advertising business in Madison Avenue in New York, just like Mad Men, moved to California with my father in 1960. And because it was New York, they actually let her work on advertising campaigns. And she went to the same agency, McCann Erickson, which had an office in San Francisco. And they said, the only job we have for you is receptionist or typist. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm not down with that. I I, I don't want anybody to think that my previous statement was no no oh no no yeah but that's that's the point that's what women wanted was no more no more of that yeah yeah and so i'm I'm down with that but but being (laughs) to me uh you know my girlfriend wants to be a a pharmacist uh a pharmacist in a hospital you know is very career oriented type of woman yeah um and me you know, she's very feminine, and I consider myself pretty somewhat masculine type person, but that's kind of where we're opposites, where I'm like, I'm sick of working, I'm sick of getting up at the crack of dawn to go climb ladders and hang heavy pipe and all that stuff. I'd rather be home with the kids. <laughs> and not that she wouldn't want that, but, you know, she'd rather be in a hospital helping sick people yeah. and, and all that stuff, but... I think it's great if women want to be stay-at-home mothers. 
in my ideal society there would be some choice there. Yeah. I also point out that the women entered the labor force in huge numbers in the 70s and 80s, not because they wanted the same rights as men, but because they had to, because there were fewer faculty factory jobs available that would provide a living wage. There was just economic pressure to work. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> when you go to get your PhD, do you have to, is it like a bachelor's degree, like do you have to declare a major, or do you have to have a specific goal in mind when you're getting your PhD? You're applying, you certainly apply to a graduate program in a field like organic chemistry or sociology in my case. Once you're in that program, at least in my case, I had a lot of latitude about what I wanted to study. And indeed, I didn't know just what I wanted to study when I started and my interests changed. But that's not always the case. Sometimes people have a very specific topic identified when they apply. In some kinds of programs, people target a certain professor they're going to work with who's doing a, studying a particular kind of thing. But in my case, no. Okay. Yeah. In the beginning of grad school, you take courses and that can allow you to identify new interests or further clarify the interests you already have. Okay. What appeal... Was it just the study of humans? Because I, I took a couple sociology classes in community college uh, a year or two ago, and and I, I loved it. I love the study of people. I think we're the most fascinating things on earth. You know, I love everything else, but was like you said, was was it was it that one class you took that really said this is it? This is the type of things. That was a lot of it. I knew I was interested in the study of people. I wasn't so interested in politics then that I might want to become a political scientist. I wasn't narrowly focused on money, although in, if I had another life, I might choose to become an economist. Psychology seemed like the obvious place to go, but it seemed too focused on experimental research, which didn't always make sense to me. And in okay. truth, there were far more prerequisites to get in the psychology program than the sociology program. Hmm. Okay. And so sociology was uh, provided a discipline I could study people in, but not be doing locked into doing experimental research as a lot of psychology is. Hmm. Okay. Now, how did you become interested in the field of sociology that you're investigating, researching now? Which is broadly all my career been the family, marriage and divorce. Uh, there is no good, re no good answer to that question, Paul. <laughs> it's, I know many people uh, who are motivated by uh, a personal interest. For example, the collaborator on my last book, which is about religion and family, is himself deeply religious. I am not. I have done a book on religion, and I'm not religious. I have a book on gender equity and the, how marriage and, ch and children have different effects on the academic careers of men and women. I'm not a woman, and I don't have kids first book was about the effects of coming from a divorced family. My parents never divorced. So I've never pursued my personal interests in my work. I've worked on things that struck me as first interesting, things that people would care about, and finally, and perhaps most important, questions that I thought could be answered. Hmm, there are people, okay. many people who will chase questions for which really can't be answered. They're not good data available. They're too broad. They're too pie in the sky. I wanted, be, I wanted to be able to say things that I knew were true about the world. Okay. And so 
the family is a topic that I just blundered into after a few years in grad school when I was looking for a dissertation topic. I took a lot, I looked at a lot of suggestions. I looked at some of the existing research in various fields that might be of interest. And this looked like one where I could make a contribution and there were good data available to let me answer the questions I wanted to answer. So most of my research is based on what's called secondary survey data. That is surveys that have already been conducted. The most famous example is just the census which the government collects every 10 years. And there are many others that are national samples and they're available to anyone who wants to analyze them. So that saves you the trouble and the money of collecting a nationally representative sample of thousands of people. You just have to have a question that hasn't been answered or you have to have a question that people have answered but think you have a better way of answering it. Okay. So once you get your PhD, Yes. Where do you go from there? When you're near finishing, you start to apply for job as a professor. And there, there are a couple of other options there. You can also apply for uh, what are called postdocs, which stands for postdoctoral fellowships. And that lets you conduct research for a couple of years and have a stronger portfolio of completed research with minimal teaching responsibilities. And so I applied to a lot of postdocs and applied to a lot of professorships and took, was only had a couple of interviews at that point and took the better of the two jobs I was offered, which is at the University of Utah. When you, when you got to Utah, what did you think? I liked Utah. It was certainly people everywhere think Utah is all Mormon, very repressive, and that is not Salt Lake City. People said crazy things like, can you get bagels there? Do you have bagels? email? Yeah. I mean, admittedly, that was 20 years ago, but can you get bagels there? Do you have email? <laughs> to which I responded only between 9 and 5 when the generator's running. Yeah, that, that's a, a someone who grew up in Utah. Yeah. And I listen to podcasts, see TV shows, whatever, yeah. Yeah. whenever Utah comes up. Some of the things people say, it's like, do, do people just view Utah as like this black hole inside of America where the rules and norms <laughs> that every, <laughs> everybody else <laughs> follows just don't apply? It's just, it's just a wasteland that yeah. Mormons literally are running every aspect of everyone's life, and it's nothing but Mormons living here. <laughs> you know, very, well, very well said, Dalton. Yeah, I haven't been to a ton of places in my life, but I've been to other states, and it's really not that much different yes. <laughs> than everywhere else. Of course. That uh, inspired one of the answers when people ask me, what's it like living in Utah? I say, it's great. I have five wives. I live in a compound in the desert. We grow a lot of hardy legumes. We have a big stock of provisions in our basement. <laughs> so when you get to the U, are you teaching a class like right off the bat? Or yep, you... yep, yep. Okay. You get there, you teach. I was assigned to teach the Introduction to Families class in my department. And I had never taken a class on the family in either college or grad school. So I had to learn a lot. Now there were some things like when I came to talk about divorce, I was more than prepared. But when I came to talk about domestic violence or the elderly or children, I had no fucking clue. Hmm. I was learning in a hurry. Okay. Were you comfortable teaching in front of a class at, at the time you started teaching? Sure. I'm pretty shameless. I don't get embarrassed in public easily. Okay, so you're comfortable <laughs> public yeah. speaking. And I taught one class in grad school. Okay. And so I'd had the experience. Yeah, it, being in front of people didn't, doesn't bother me. Now, were you, when you first came to Utah to teach, did you think about living here permanently, or were you always going to stay in the Bay Area? I wanted to be in California. 
I didn't know quite how that would happen in the first few years. I was at the U. I actually had job interviews at UC Berkeley and UC Davis, which is about an hour away. Sadly, neither thought uh, well enough of me to retain my services. But I liked Utah. I hate the winter, being from California. Snow is bullshit. <laughs> Snow is a horrible fuckery. As all my friends have heard me say, my four seasons are heaven, hell, hope, and dread. This is hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny like like this winter it's it's been pretty mild <laughs> the whole time I've just been thinking like if it's going to be winter if it's not going to be 70 plus and sunny let's just have it be zero degrees and snowing every day why it's awful you just walk outside and you feel assaulted and you slip in the snow and fall and then your car keys fly out of your hands and they land in a snow drift and you can't find them and your hands are getting numb and your fingers are turning red and then the lock is frozen and you're fumbling with the keys i mean yeah i i thought about jack london those jack london stories about freezing to death often in the winter yes i exaggerate but Nah, it's fucking awful. You spend all your time putting on clothes and taking off clothes and makes going to the gym an ordeal. Ah, fuck winter. It keeps you humble, keeps you on your toes, lets you know Mother Nature can still kill you. <laughs> yeah, fuck no, winter. Uh, yeah, no, I'm with you. No, I'm with you. It's not my favorite, especially the air quality. Yeah. Okay, so you start teaching. How does research and teaching... How does that balance out? What are you starting to study? Are you working with other professors? So not yet. And I have to say that between the end of grad school and becoming a professor, what I was doing changed very little. I was still teaching in grad school. Most of the time I was a teaching assistant. Now I was teaching, but I was still doing research was was the same. Nothing changed. I still sat at home and did it. I wasn't even paid that much more. The starting salary at the University of Utah in 1998 was 30, $35,500 a year. Uh, by the time I was at the, uh, the highest end of the teaching scale, the teaching assistant pay scale at UCLA was about over $1,500 a month. So my pay didn't even go up that much. Little, okay. cha little changed. I had a title now. Really also, the other thing is you, I think this is common, is you spend the first few months your professor with the imposter syndrome, thinking, I don't really belong here. I, if they'll find out. You know, I'm not really qualified. And after you get over that, you become entitled. <laughs> <laughs> They're not treating me right. I've heard uh, some people describe the academic scene of people who went to school and never left as far as professors. And yes, like, yes, and, and that's that accurate. They have... And of course, this maybe I want to hear your opinion applies to some people that that some people not having experience in the workforce or outside of academia kind of hinders their view of the world. Do you have any opinions or comments on that type of statement? My reaction to that is it's largely bullshit. I would occasionally get. Uh, on my teaching evaluations, he's not qualified to teach this class because I don't have kids. And my response is, God, would you want a Nazi teaching your class on Nazi Germany? Who would teach the class on ancient Rome? You'd need a time machine. And that doesn't even answer the question about who's going to teach the class about theoretical physics, right? You'd have to be a neutron to teach that class. I mean, you know, so yeah. that's that's part of it. Now it's certainly possible that professors, you know, can have an academic knowledge of something, and would benefit from having some experience down in the trenches. This is why I'm not dogmatically wedded to just doing 
statistical research. I last couple of books also had a lot of qualitative re- components, that is in-depth interviews of people. I think you, in doing social research, you have both the, both the quantitative and the qualitative. You need both to get a full picture. Okay. That gives you a full picture, and then you're less likely to be someone who has no idea what they're talking about or only has a detached bird's eye view of what they're talking about. Hmm. I mean, certainly, you know, it's possible for professors to, yeah, it's certainly possible for professors to be too detached, but I don't think that's the norm. It's, it's sort of an easy, it's always an easy objection, right? Yeah. Right. They are not doing it, so how they, they can talk about it. But I, in general, just re- reject that. I aspire to a more universalist mode of knowledge. And I certainly don't, I'm not a big fan of identity politics. The idea that you need, oh, anyhow, I'm going on a tangent, but you get the idea. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Did you enjoy, <clears throat> or... What did you think about the U, you know, after a year or two in? What did you think about the U sociology program, <laughs> uh, the tools and opportunities or uh, resources that you had to do the research you wanted to? You've made a very common mistake. I am not in the sociology department. I am in an interdisciplinary department, which I think is called Family and Consumer Studies, but may have voted to change its name. The sociology department in the U is uh, a fine department with a lot of energetic, young, and mid-career scholars, but I'm not in it. I'm in an interdisciplinary department. And certainly, there's a lot of a lot of pressure universities place on people these days to be interdisciplinary. That is to have consider the psychology, the physiology, the genetics, the multiple disciplined perspective on a social problem. And so I think that was the promise of an interdisciplinary department devoted by and large setting families. That having been said, none of that uh, really factored in my career. And it's not a secret. Uh, I've never been very happy with my department. Indeed, I've written about it publicly, some of my experiences with the Title IX case. Yeah. Now, I have found uh, a few people to collaborate with over the years and have written a few scholarly articles with some of my colleagues and co-authored a book or co-edited a book with one of them. So I certainly had some collaborative opportunities. Most of the people are not doing the kind of research I do. A lot of the people in my department are now doing sort of public health research and that's not quite what I do okay I do appreciate the the I don't know if the, the term balls or guts to huh. uh, write your title nine articles <laughs> I, feel, I feel like there's a lot of I don't know maybe you can disagree with this or put your input but there's a lot of professors out there that wouldn't write that type of thing because they wouldn't want to <laughs> create waves I think any discussion of what a professor's life is like has to talk about tenure. If you're a professor at a research university, or indeed even many teaching universities, there's two kinds of professors. There are those hired on the tenure track, such as I am, and then there are those hired off it who are often called adjuncts or contingent faculty, and they just have semester or year-long contracts. And so it's a very two-tiered labor system where the tenure-track faculty, such as myself, are treated well, paid better, and the adjunct faculty are underpaid and often mistreated. I think it says it all that 15 years ago someone published a book about adjunct faculty called academic sharecroppers. <laughs> yeah. But where there's no job security, you're 
often you know, the pay is low. Sometimes people are teaching 10 courses and just paid two or three thousand dollars for each of them. Wow. That's and over time, an increasing number of the new professors hired are hired in that capacity because it's cheaper for the university. Otherwise, it's bad for just about everyone else. It's bad for those people. It's bad for the students. But that's a re- that's been a real issue. Perhaps the the major issue facing higher education faculties in America is how much of the labor force is now adjuncts. But I'm lucky. I was hired in a position that was tenure track. So here's what that means. There's a probationary period of six or seven years where you show that you're a, going to be a productive scholar. You're going to publish books and scholarly articles. And then there's a very thorough review of you where they go through all levels of the university and solicits opinions of your research by professors outside the university. And if all goes well, you get tenure. And tenure is a very, is a very rare job benefit. It basically means I cannot be fired except for cause, right? If I commit a felony on campus, if I just refuse to do my job, then I could be fired. Otherwise, I can't be fired. Okay. Yeah, so who else has that? Uh, Some federal judges have that. Uh, I can't think of too many other professions or fields that have, or, you know, workplaces that have that. Why does it exist? Well, the traditional explanation is to defend my intellectual freedom. So I can say shit that may piss people off, that may be politically incorrect, where I can take my own university to the woodshed, as I did my Title IX articles. I can say things unpopular because the search for the truth may be unpopular. And that's certainly part of it, but a perhaps an equally important reason why tenure exists is it's part of my pay. They can The university can pay me less because it gives me this unusual job benefit. Yeah, I, when did when did that start? The whole tenure thing. That's a, I you know I don't really know I don't really know when that started, but at least uh, in the throughout the 20th century, that's been that's been the norm in higher education in America, and I believe before then too. I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. I'm sure Wikipedia has the answer. Yes. Uh, I guess where I want to go to next is how did you – what is your first book about? What's the process of that, and how much did that involve the university? So my first book is really based on my dissertation. It's about answering the question – If you grow up in a divorced family, how does it affect your own marital behavior? And I had already written, so I'd already written a long document of the sort, but dissertations or long research reports, it wasn't quite as user-friendly as a book might be. I also, I just gave a jujitsu training partner a copy of that book and I said, to write books successfully, and he's actually a professor, but he's an article guy, not a book guy. And I said, to write books, first you have to learn how to write like an academic, and then you have to unlearn how to write like an academic if you want anyone to read your book and not have it filled with stilted, stiff, fake scientific prose. I had to basically rewrite the thing from the ground up. I... (laughs) I I uh, uh I'll tell you why I hold on one sec. Oh uh shit. Okay. So you asked how the university helped me write the book, and the university didn't so much, but I had an incredible stroke of good fortune. That's really a story I've never heard of anyone having in higher education. In the f- very first class I taught at the university. Perhaps the best student in the large lecture class was a woman maybe 
uh, 10 years older than me, or a little younger, and so a non-traditional student. And she was very involved in the class. And then at one point, about halfway through, she said, my husband and I have a foundation. We'd like to fund your research. And that went right in one ear and out the other, because who'd ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> what class was this? This was just Introduction to Families. Okay. okay. Um, I, I just, the idea that someone might, obviously I know people who have a lot of money have foundations, but the idea that they may just walk up to someone and say, it hadn't happened to me or anyone I know. But then I eventually actually listened. And I can, this was, her name was Jeanette Byerly. And Byerly was an old-fashioned kind of orange soda. I don't know if it's still made in the United States, but it's still, still consumed abroad. But 60, 70 years ago, it was a very popular drink. And so she and her husband, Bill Byerly, were heirs to a large soda pop fortune. And so some, as wealthy people tend to do, they create a foundation to fund the things that they deem worthwhile. And so they paid me $95,000, not directly, but through the university, to subsidize writing my first book. Wow. Just because she had been a student in my class. I mean, that's just, it's an incredible stroke of good fortune. I'd never heard of that happening to anyone else. And so I, that gave me a lot of time off teaching in my first few years at the university uh, to help me get the book done. So now, who <clears throat> that money, um, how does the school handle that? How do, how, do they, how does it get distributed? Do you say, here's what the budget should be put towards, here's what I need? How yes. does that process work? Yes. Okay. Those are good questions. Every university has an office devoted to what are called sponsored projects. Because especially in the hard sciences, where there's a lot of equipment and machinery involved in the medical sciences, where there's huge equipment costs and human subjects costs, they can't do their research about big grants. A lot of those grants come from the federal government, and that's how a lot of discoveries happen in America. It's federal money funding science. There's also less federal money available for the social sciences. Uh, both as a question of priorities and because in the social sciences there are fewer equipment needs. And so the universities need offices to administer this money. There are, and so it comes from the federal government, it comes from foundations of various sizes, and uh, some of it, depending upon the field, comes from the private sector, like especially when it, dr drug research, pharmaceutical research. Right, there are pharmaceutical companies to subsidize that research. Okay. And so the universities have an office, and you submit a budget, and the budget can pay for a variety of things. It can pay for less teaching, which is what I was most interested in. It can pay what's called summer salary. And academics, you're on a nine-month contract because teaching goes nine months of the year. You're paid all year long, but technically that's only consuming nine months of your time, which means up to three months can be funded by a grant as, as summer salary. So in other words, you can get a third more pay if you can get grants that will pay your salary. Hmm. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. And it can also pay for it's going to also pay you'll pay for equipment, going to conferences, research assistance, and that kind of stuff. And there's a downside here. We're increasingly, as public funding dries up for colleges, they want you to get grants, and they view getting grants as almost more important than doing research because, of course, the university gets a kind of grants. And it gets a cut, which is just subtracted for administering the whole thing. Okay. So you get this money. We were just interrupted by technological issues, but getting back 
to, we were talking about research funding and how, especially at public universities, there's too much pressure placed on faculty to apply for grants. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to understand that. I mean, money is what fuels everything. So, so when you get that grant, do you feel a lot of pressure to fulfill a promise or a duty to write this book, or are you excited? What What are your feelings when you get that grant? It's great getting a grant because it's going to help you get research done and make your life a lot easier in the process. But promise, no. Indeed, you can fuck a granting agency and pay no penalty aside from the fact that you won't get a grant from them in the future. Yeah, it'll ruin your reputation. Well, even possibly just with them. And it happens occasionally where people just get ripped off. Now, if you do something criminal, with them, you know, if you just take the money and somehow put it in your pocket, then you'll be subject to criminal charges. But if you take the money and spend it as you're supposed to and don't do the actually do the research, there's little recourse aside from just you not getting grants in the future. And maybe, I assume... Many granting agencies, some will talk to each other, so you might get a bad reputation if you kept doing that. Okay, so does the university just um, write you a fat check? No, no, it doesn't work that way at all. So consider, consider what you're spending it on. If you're a physical scientist, you're spending it on equipment, and you're sub typically submitting receipts receipts for reimbursement or having the university write checks to vendors to buy your your spectrometron or your hydrologizer or whatever the fuck kind of equipment <laughs> hard scientist okay. uses. Uh, if it's a research assistant, it's university paying them. The only fat check you get is either reimbursement for equipment you buy or just added to your regular check from the university for for summer salary, which I described a minute ago. Okay. So they're administering the whole thing. So you're pretty pumped up when you get this grant. Oh, every, absolutely. It's always good news. And when you got the grant, you had a specific topic, uh, thesis, yes, whatever I was, academic word you want to use. <laughs> I was already writing this book about the divorce cycle, how divorce runs in families. And so I... In the proposal I wrote them, I, you know, and it wasn't a very formal proposal because I knew they were going to fund me. I just explained the book I was going to write and what I had done and what I still need to do. I would have done, I would have written the book anyhow. It might have taken a little longer, but that work would have happened because there was none of it. What I was getting paid was really essential for me doing the work, but that's the luxury I have as someone who mostly analyzes secondary data. I don't need a lot of money to do my work. I just need a good computer and internet connection. <laughs> if you don't need that much money, like if you don't use the full grant, what happens to that money? It goes back to whomever gave it to you. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. And with your first book, you didn't have anybody else. It's just it was basically all on you yep, to write yep, it. Yep, Cause, no, cause yeah. in, in your latest book, you had a co-writer. Yeah, co-author. Yeah, but the co first co-author. Yeah, first one was all me. Okay, and what's the name of that book? It's called Understanding the Divorce Cycle: The Children of Divorce in Their Own Marriages. It was published in 2005 by Cambridge University Press. Nice. Yeah. And so, so when you finish that, you get it published. <clears throat> Were you happy with the results? When it was all said and done, how did you feel? I felt pretty good about it. Looking back on it, I think it could have been more readable just because I hadn't fully unlearned how to write as a scientist. I hadn't learned how to write for a more popular audience. So it could have been clearer, but I feel good about I stand behind the science of what I found, and I feel good about it. Okay. When you get a grant and you publish a book, yes. Um, is a university like? Do you have a boss, so to speak? Do you have someone not, not like a, a traditional boss, but is there somebody saying like, "Good job, Nick! Like you're on the right track. This is really good." Not, How does that work? Not really. 
uh, there's a uh, departments have chairs and then colleges have deans and so forth. But no, uh, there's no, but, you know, there's some, you know, there's some social pressure if you're someone's friend to say good job and congratulations on your book. But if you're just someone whose relationship is a is, I mean, you know, it's the polite thing to say, right? But there's always the point that if if you just wrote, if I'm congratulating you on your book, I didn't write a book of my own, <laughs> and that's that's you know that dynamic isn't you know is is petty and isn't always in place. But you know, there's some competition. There's some competition. But no, there's no one in the university whose job it is to say good job. Writing a book is a pretty is a pretty tangible metric, right? It's everyone knows what it means when you say, "I just wrote a book." Yeah. So can you get that book on Amazon or? Yes. Like it's it's still yeah, out there it's, being it's, published. It's still yeah. 14 years later, amazingly, it's still in print. Actually, just two days ago, I bought five copies because I had just given away one of my last copies. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah. So everybody listening, go buy that book. <laughs> Don't buy that book. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, you have to be interested in the topic, and it's, as I said, dense reading. And it's, even though even the paperback is not cheap, the, even the paperback is like $30 or $35 because it's an academic book. It's written by an academic press, uh, so it wasn't, you know, it didn't come out in a mass market cheap paperback. Go buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dalton. That's nice of you. That book, for some reason, but no others, there was a period of time, a year or two, where every other day I would get an email telling, informing me that someone in Russia had pirated the book. How did you feel about that? <laughs> I was amused. Were you just kind of happy that someone was interested? Yes. Uh, so like a lot of academics, I have a Google standing Google keyword search on my own name, just so if anyone's talking about me, I can see what they've said. And so that's how I learned about what's happening in Russia. But my rule, and don't tell my publisher this, is if you're from England or America and you want to know about the book, uh, I you, you can go buy a copy, but if you're in the developing world, the pub you know the publisher doesn't want me to, but I would just send them a I would just send them an electronic copy. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yeah. So I you know, I sent sent that to sent it to someone in Iran. I mean, you know, you start getting emails intermittently from all over the world because your name someone googles the topic and your name pops up well i feel i think that's kind of cool oh yeah i think that's cool too i mean i'm always anytime anyone emails and says i saw your book or i saw an article about your research i'm always happy to hear from that person and always email those people back i got someone emailed me a picture of a newspaper article which mentioned my research from madagascar nice yeah <laughs> talk about obscure uh and it wasn't even someone i knew it was turned out it was just a grad student in some other field i don't know how why they thought to contact me but i'm glad she did it was fun nice so <clears throat> uh what have you been researching lately oh don't What's you the... don't you want to know about all the fucking money well, yeah. Well, I guess, <laughs> like the money you gain from the books or the grants. No, from the books, right? All that cocaine and lobster money you get from publishing academic books. Yeah, I mean, I just assumed you got a Challenger sitting in your garage, so. It's ten years old. Hey, it's still a Challenger. <laughs> uh, you get very little money from publishing academic books. On a good year, I've gotten a thousand dollars. On a bad year, I've gotten a letter saying we didn't sell enough copies to pay to write you a check, so we're not going to write you a check. <laughs> well, at least they wrote you and let you know. Yeah, the one way to make money, 
doing that kind of thing is to write a textbook because those get assigned to classes and those can make a lot of money. Yeah, I've heard that. That is there any? I don't know how to put this. Is a, an incentive for people who write textbooks to constantly update those textbooks yes. for, so yes. they keep getting updated and more money? Yes, absolutely. The publisher will insist, you know, will pressure you to write a new edition every two years so they can sell new editions to students, and uh, you're on a treadmill. Yeah, I, I've heard about that stuff, but, I mean, if there's a lot of money in it, I I can't blame the author for doing it. Yeah, but, you know, I I like money just fine, but uh, time is a more valuable commodity to me at this point in my life. Really yeah. always has been. So how much... Uh, how much money could someone make off a textbook? A lot. Uh, you know, actually, I don't know how much ultimately, but I think you could, you know, if a really successful textbook could make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. But I don't know what, the, I, I, that's a really good question, just how much, depending upon the field. I, it probably depends upon how narrow the field is or how broad it is, how many editions it goes into. I'm sure a little Googling could show an answer there. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I've never. It also seems like sh sh it would be shit boring to write one. Um, so I've never considered it. Although that's the only kind of book I'm really ever asked to write. No one ever comes to me and says, "Hey, write a research book about so and so." But I've been approached more than once saying, "Would you like to write a textbook for us?" Hmm. Okay. So what do, what have you been working on lately? Huh. You want to ghost write a textbook on for me, Dalton? We can just split the money. Uh, I did pretty good in English classes, surprisingly good. Um, <laughs> based um, some people, or at least some people might be surprised based on how well I speak. But writing a whole textbook that's a little above my skill set. Now the the trick to writing a book is to try to write two. Double space pages a day. Hmm. Writing is hard, so just in short, you know, in short doses, in short little. Yeah, it's hard. Writing is <laughs> always writing is always hard. Even people who have written a zillion books say writing is hard. Oh yeah. yeah. What am I working on now? I have a book under contract at Oxford University Press on the changing economics of single motherhood. Mm, okay. And I've already published, and this is with a guy named Matt McKeever who teaches at Haverford College, the fancy liberal arts school in Philadelphia. We've already d published several papers and I've written some popular articles about this and uh, Pacific Standard and National Review. The, the, the starting point is this. Single mother families are five times as likely as two parent families to be poor. That's a, that's a very well established finding. But the interesting thing is 40 years ago, single mother families were five times as likely as two parent families to be poor. How could that be the same for 40 years? 40 years where women have a lot more education much more likely to work, have better jobs and more work experience. How could that not have changed? And that's our question. Uh, and that's a good question to have. I like that. And so there's a couple of answers. I can tell you the answers. One, of course, is that men's wages have stagnated, but that's the part everyone already knows. What we bring to the table is the fact that the composition of the pool of single mothers has changed a lot over time. In particular, 30, 40 years ago, most single mothers were divorced women. Nowadays, most single mothers are women who had children before they were married. And in terms of their earning potential, their economics, these are two very different populations. Divorced women look a lot like married women, minus a husband's income. Women who give birth out of wedlock are totally different. They are far less likely to work, have less education, 
when they do work, they get lower return. They make less money. They get lower returns to their education. They are more likely to grow up in families, in single parent families themselves. They're far less likely to grow up in families that have library cards or newspaper subscriptions. They are just profoundly disadvantaged. And that's 40% of all births now occur out of wedlock in America. So that's a lot of people these days. Yeah, I wonder... Well, I, I guess you're the right person to ask of how legitimate is marriage? Is it a thing that should be in a society? Like, you yes. Know, it is, yes. How long has, been, has marriage been around in the sense or in the way that it is today? Certainly there have been some changes, but the quick answer is throughout recorded human history. And so what marriage is is a complicated subject with social, psychological, religious, and legal answers. Those, all, of those, all of those things are important. And I mean, marriage, I can tell you that, you know, over 80% of Americans will still marry in their lifetime. The vast majority of people want to be married. Uh, so, yeah, it's still very much a thing. So a broad research finding that's motivated a lot of my research and a lot of just a lot of people's research in recent years is something we've noticed over the last 40 years, one of the big social trends in America. 40 years ago, no matter how much education or money you had, your marriage rates and divorce rates were pretty similar. Now, it's a social class thing where if you have a four-year college degree, you're likely to get married, likely to stay married. Where if you don't have a four-year college degree, you're likely to have children before marriage. And if you do get married, you're a lot more likely to get divorced. So there's a big class divide in marriage. That's, that's pretty fascinating. Because yeah. like you hear people say, oh, marriage is just a piece of paper <laughs> and just a ring. But from what you're saying, it's much, much more than that. Yes. There have been some studies. So there was one big question that a lot of research have been looking about on marriage in recent years is, does marriage change people in positive ways? Or is it the kinds of people who are likely to get married more likely to earn a lot of money, be healthy, be happy, and so forth? There's an increasing amount of evidence showing that, indeed, it's just the people who are likely to earn more money are more likely to be married. The kinds of people who are healthier, physically healthier people get married. Hmm. Now, I think the, just the piece of paper, I think the best version of that I ever heard was from a sociologist named Don Moon, who had a chapter in the edited book I published about 15 years ago, who just told me over coffee one time that marriage is a license from the state to have sex with the same person. <laughs> well, you don't need a license to do that, so yeah. that's a little little <laughs> bit off. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought it was, I mean, I ultimately disagreed with her on substance, but I thought it, I thought it was clever. Yeah. Right. Well, of course, you don't need a license to drive, but you get one to drive, right? Yeah. Anyhow, uh, so I think the role of marriage in society is important for various reasons that we could get into, probably say for another podcast. So, but that's that's the kind of question a lot of my research looks at. I, I appreciate your uh, work and effort into those subjects because you know that the stuff <clears throat> seems to me the stuff you've been studying and working on affects everybody. So I feel like it is very important. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a therapist, I'm not a clinician, so I don't have a lot of good practical suggestions for people that had to have better marriages. I can tell people, you know, whose work there I think is good, but yeah, I I just sketch the broad landscape. Well, I just still think that's important. Thank you, Dalton. Thank you. I don't want to I don't want you to downplay your work. Well, it's no, well, it's. I mean, it's inter It's interesting to me, and people find it interesting. 
I mean, I've it's certainly I've been in the media a lot just because people are interested in this kind of stuff. In the last couple of years, they've also written a lot of a lot of short pieces, data pieces about sex. And we could probably talk about those some other time. But who's having sex? How much sex are they having? Are they having more sex than they used to? Yeah, I'd love to have an episode on that. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's been some... I actually mentioned... You know, a really good piece. I think my, so my first recommendation of the series, or a good article in the Atlantic, about why young people are having less sex than they used to. There's a sex recession. That's disappointing to hear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. not good. That means yes. people aren't as happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Huh. Well, uh, I. This has been fun for me to talk about and seems feel slightly self-indulgent, but that's okay. No, it's fine. I mean, I think it's good for our listeners to hear where you came from, what you're all about, just get some, some more info on you. Um, maybe down the road we'll have a, a short mini episode on myself or my life, and you can ask me a bunch of questions on what it's like to be a sprinkler fitter from bountiful utah <laughs> certainly and you know it doesn't have to be short it really doesn't have to be short yeah well i've i don't have much more uh i don't have much to say because i'm also still i mean today is my birthday i turned 25 years old but happy I don't birthday have, happy birthday you. dalton i don't have tons of experience in life so I try not to talk too much. And that's one of the things about this podcast is I want to more listen than spout a bunch of bullshit that I'm not fully educated on. But you can't let me bullshit too much. And it's no, it's it's boring if I just run my trap. So I'm, you know, oh, yeah. yeah, this is very much a two person endeavor. Oh, we'll just wait till we do our taxes episode, which might be the next one. Okay. But that, that's one where I'm uh, pretty pretty firm I, I, in my stance of it, so, uh, to a certain extent. But that, that's definitely an episode where I have some questions that I would love to hear okay. your answer and perspective on. Okay. Do you have a recommendation this week? Um... Do you have one? Sure. <laughs> Let's uh, hear you go one first. One of the books I've read recently that's perhaps the shortest but very interesting and eye-opening and enjoyable is by the veteran investigative jur- uh, journalist and author Michael Lewis, who's probably best known for writing Moneyball, also The Big Short. His latest book is called The Fifth Risk. It's really short. It's only about 200 pages, but it will tell you much give you a lot of insight into just what the government does and indeed how they keep us safe in many ways it's a very short interesting read the fifth risk by michael lewis he's in general a great writer and i enjoyed every book of his i've written i've read that's good yeah. I'm glad you have one. Last few, <laughs> you haven't had a record. No. <laughs> but when you do, you have good ones. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of mine. Here's my recommendation. Yeah. Go If you haven't, go to a jiu-jitsu class. Go experience some grappling. It'll be good for you. I promise you. We could both have that recommendation every week, Dalton. Yep. Both, both jiu-jitsu lifers. Well, even though we may not say... That's our recommendation for the week. Yeah. It is our recommendation for the week. <laughs> Always. It's a recommendation right. 20, 25 8. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, guys. Please, if you like what you hear, or even if you didn't, consider giving us a tip top rating. Share us on social media. Scrawl our URL on bathroom walls. Give us positive reviews on YouTube, Apple, anywhere else. Hell yeah, do it. Do it.